description, this is the threads that connect a virtual conference. Uh, this is our fourth presentation, virtual presentation in our series. Um, my name is Slavka Shulakevich, and I'm a director with the with ACRA, Alberta Council for the Ukrainian Arts. I am pleased to um, introduce first uh, Josie Chartrand, um, a master's of art, is an assistant uh, professor in the Department of Theater at McEwen University. Her research focuses on the embedded performativity of a live performance costume and has been informed by a continued career as a costume designer, maker, and educator. She recently published a case study on costumes worn by the Pavlov Ukrainsky Ballet 1922 to 1931 and has curated exhibi exhibitions uh, on dress and costume at the Human Ecology Gallery and the Mitchell Art Gallery. Josie is joined in the, um, this afternoon's presentation by Marianne Bazyuk, a former Shumka dancer, member of distinction, and donor uh, whose daughters participate, um, and donor, sorry, and whose uh, daughters participate in Shumka, brought her back to the company as a Shumka mom. Marianne has continued as a dedicated costume volunteer with the company ever since. Our next presenter is Kathy Chumetsky, or Katya uh, Chumetska is a Master's of Arts graduate student from the Department of Modern Languages and Cultural Studies with a specialization in media and cultural studies. In the fall, she will be attending Indiana University to pursue a PhD in folklore studies. We'll be, we'll be sorry to, to lose you, Katya, but hopefully you'll be coming back afterwards. Um, having had the opportunity to work with archival collections and cultural communities in her RA position at the Cool Folklore Center and through many different work experiences, Katya's experiences have influenced her research to focus on the ways in which communities create, preserve, and revitalize a variety of forms of material culture. Uh, with an emphasis on textile art, Katya is currently studying the role of material culture in transnational folklore, focusing on Ukraine and the Ukrainian Canadian diaspora. Her research interests include decolonization theories, material culture studies, folklore, women and gender studies, and post Soviet spaces. So, there you have our presenters for today. And I um, welcome Josie uh, to take over and please uh, begin. Hello, um, and thank you all for tuning into this event as part of the Threads That Connect Symposium hosted by the Ukrainian Resource and Development Center here at McEwen University. My name is Jose Chartrand, and as my name may suggest, I am not directly of Ukrainian descent. Uh, my relationship to this project instead comes from my uh, connection to costumes directly. I am an assistant professor in the Department of Theater and an, uh, am a costume designer, maker, educator, and researcher. I like to study the embedded performativity of performance costume and was so excited to be invited to engage in a Ukrainian related research project for this symposium. I'm equally excited to introduce my partner in this presentation. Marianne Bazyuk has a rich and continued relationship with Ukrainian dance, and I have asked her to share her own experiences with you now. My Ukrainian dance experiences began as a young child in our church basement. I believe I was at least seven or eight years old, and much, which is much older than the beginners of dance training today. My first instructor was Chester Coots, who played piano for us to dance to as he instructed us. Weekly lessons and costume making by our moms let us experience time on stage to show off our expertise at the steps and dances we learned throughout the year. My last two instructors were Jean Swastesky, who later became our daughter's, our first daughter's godfather, and Vladi Shanko. It was Vlad who encouraged our group to audition for Shumka. We followed Vlad's lead, and in 1971, a group of us became a full-fledged members of the Ukrainian Shumka dancers. Shumka has taken me across Canada and around the world in, in the 14 years that I performed with them. There are many cherished memories and everlasting friendships that were formed over those years. One most important friendship was finding my true love, 
and after 38 years this summer, we have Shimka to thank for bringing us together. With my two daughters' interest in dance and them becoming Shimka dancers as well, led me back to Shimka. I was accepted into the group of ladies fondly known as the Shimka moms. We would meet sometimes three times a week to prepare and maintain costumes for the current dancers. It's a group that I can proudly say I'm still a part of after long after my daughters have retired from dancing. Shimka has been a part of my life for the last 50 years. From the first time my red boots hit the stage to now making our dancers shine on stage in their costumes has been such a fulfilling experience. With that biography, I'm sure those listening to our presentation can understand how important Marianne's voice is to the, is to the telling of this particular story. Before getting into the body of our presentation, I would also like to acknowledge that we are speaking to you from Treaty 6 territory, which is the traditional gathering place of many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit who have called this territory home since long before our European ancestors colonized and settled on this land. This is especially important to this project as Ukrainian Dance in Canada came about largely as a means for immigrant communities to remember and to celebrate their homeland. This project studies the materiality of Shumka's Vinok and begins to explore the relationship female Ukrainian dancers have with them. There is simply too much to say about the full design, symbolism, history, and construction of complete Ukrainian dance costumes, which is why we have focused our work today specifically on the Vinoks at Shumka. In Ukrainian culture, the wreath or Vinok was traditionally worn by unmarried maidens to show off their purity and marital eligibility. The Vinok remains a part of Ukrainian national attire that is worn on festive occasions and holy days. It has also become a staple in virtually all female Ukrainian dance costume. The Vinok headpiece embodies the essence of the art form and the ones worn by current Shumka dancers tell a very special story unique to the company and to the performers who wear them. Shumka's Poktava costume is one that every dancer must purchase when they join the company. And the costume, including the Vinok, is custom made to their measurements. It is the only costume that belongs to the dancers all others belong to, the, to Shimka directly. And the dancers are responsible for taking care of it and for bringing it with them to performances. Shimka dancers are often asked to dance at events outside of the studio and will usually wear this costume at those events. Owning this costume also means that dancers have something to take with them when they retire from the company. Shumka's Poltava Vinok is decorated in red, blue, white, and yellow flowers over a velvet vase that matches the color of their jupon jackets and aprons, which today are either red, burgundy, green, or blue, but also used to include gold. The Vinok is secured to the dancer's hair with three combs and tied around the base of the neck with a length of cotton bias tape. Worn under the Vinok on a separate band are, seven, are 17 yellow, red, blue, and green ribbons that cascade from beneath the dancer's hair. Together, this ribbon and the floral headpiece make up Shumka's Poltava Vinok. It is not replaced through a dancer's tenure with the company, which means that from the very first day it is worn, it begins to wear out. There are many Ukrainian cultural beliefs and traditions reflected in this costume. And while not all of them were intentionally sought out by the company, they are present within the costumes, and I will briefly share some of those details found in this Vinok. The colors of the Poltava Vinok have become a symbol of Shumka, but there is more to be found in the details. Blue corn flowers represent simplicity and modesty. Yellow and white daisies symbolize peace, tenderness, love, and faithfulness. And the red poppies are considered the flower of dreams, beauty, and youth. Hidden in the Vinoks are also a series of roses that are not seen when the Vinok is completed. They are used to create the base to increase the height and volume of the flowers that are seen, but get covered by all the other flowers when it's completed. Roses symbolize love and hope. For the past 12 years, the Vinoks have all been made by Darlene Seridiak and Joyce Howell, but they they, and, but they were used to be assembled by a group of Shimka moms together. For a number of years, we were walked through the process by Darlene and a very special tradition used to be inviting the new dancer moms to make their daughters first Shimka Vinok. I made both my daughters Vinoks and I can attest that after a long evening spent hot gluing the flowers into place, our work culminated in an ultimate feeling of satisfaction. We knew that by accomplishing these Vinoks, we are contributing to the appearance and the quality of the show and of our daughters. Ribbons are also an integral part of the Vinok, and much like the flowers, each color likewise has a specific meaning. These four represent the colors that, that are used in the Shimka, Shimka's Poltava Vinok. The yellow, which represents the sun, green, the beauty and youth, blue, sky and water, red, magic and sadness. 
There is also a rather lovely belief that more the more colorful the Vinok, the happier the girl will be. And the contrasting colors in the dancers Vinok certainly look lovely from the audience. In addition to the physical attributes uniform across all of the Poltava Vinoks, there are also details individual to each dancer. On the right is a new Vinok made for a first year dancer with the company. When this photograph was taken, it had never been worn. The flowers are pristine, tiny filaments of hot glue can be seen from when the flowers were first attached, and you can see the exacting details of how the bias tape is finished with zigzag stitches hemmed and attached to the vinok, with what can, one can only assume is a lot of repeated stitches to prevent it from pulling out. On the left is a vinok of a retired dancer. It is very clear that this costume has been worn in innumerable performances. The flowers have collapsed and frayed, the ties have been stretched, the combs have been reinforced with new stitches, and the ribbon piece has frayed ends, which you will see on a later slide. But these signs of wear are not visible from a distance, and both Vinox appear uniform under stage lights. Since it does not affect how the audience sees the costume, only how the performer sees it from up close, there is no need or interest to replace them through a dancer's time with the company. As such, this Vinok becomes a document of sorts that reflects the dancer's career with Shumka to anyone who cares to look closely at it. There are many factors that wear these costumes down over time. In order to stay secured in place, a dancer must ensure that the combs are tightly anchored into their hair so it does not shift or fall while performing. And by looking at how stretched out the ties on, or on this Vinok have become, you can see how tightly the girls tie them. Interesting though, they are easily removed for costume changes. The girls tie their bows with a double twist so they don't fall loose, but need only to tug on the ties to be removed. The process is not a gentle one, but is what these costumes are designed and built for. There is also the matter of storage. Pictured here is the box that Marianne's daughter has always kept her dancing accessories in, even now that she has retired. While well packaged, the lid confines the Vinok and any agitations caused from traveling with the costume, either to and from the theater or while on tour, causes the Vinok to move around and to crush the flowers. While not all dancers use this style of box, it does seem to be a leading cause of where the Vinok flowers sustain over time. These boxes also contain other accessories like hairpins, tights, their red beads, makeup, sponges, and Q-tips. It all really looks like a game of Tetris, the way that these components all fit together so tightly. All these items need to be, uh, all these items are needed for each performance, and this way they are always easily on hand. Although not pictured, it is also home to the second half of the Vinok, the ribbons. The ribbons are all stored safely rolled together, so they take up as little space as possible without being creased. Uh, and as such, they don't need to be ironed or steamed between performances, although of course they could be if needed. Overall, there's little to no mending required on these costumes or these Vinoks. The most common fix is that the common the comb break or comes loose and needs to be replaced. And if a tie falls loose, it'll also be reinforced. These repairs can either be done by the dancers at home, often with the help of a family member, or they can be brought to the costume shop for repairs, but they are really designed to last well beyond a dancer's time with Shimka. It is also interesting to note that generally speaking, the Vinoks are never cleaned. They will be steamed on occasion to make the flowers perk up, but usually that is all they need. And then, of course, there are the impacts of dancing. Sweat, hairspray, and makeup all become embedded little by little in the headpiece. Lipstick in particular transfers to the ribbons. I apologize for the pinging from my email. I don't know how to turn that off. Um, but lipstick in particular transfers onto the ribbons as the dancers spin around and they get whipped in the face by their own costumes. Um, the Movement from the rapid spins and other impacts of choreography will likewise eventually, like wind, fray the ends of the ribbons and possibly the flowers as well. While each ribbon tip is finished with fray check, they do slightly fray over time. When a dancer is being measured for their first V-knock the in, the in the costume shop, we have a series of pre-cut plastic patterns to lay across the dancer's head. The correct size is the one that covers to the bottom of the dancer's earlobes. Encased within the velvet is a rigid plastic form carefully cut to a uniform height. The pieces are cut from large plastic bu buckets so that they naturally curve. The overall weight of this costume, while light, is still enough to be a constant reminder of its presence on a dancer's neck, but not so heavy as to ever impede a dancer's ability to move. New dancers are often encouraged to wear their vinox in rehearsal to become familiar with the feeling of the headpiece and the movements of their ribbons. It is great fun to see a new dancer put on their Vinok for the first time. 
the dancers have to wear their full Potava costume, and we actually cut their ribbons while they're wearing them to be so that they're even to the bottom of their chupons. If we tried cutting the ribbons lying on a table, the hem would be uneven because the elastic band securing the ribbons to the dancers curve around their heads. In the case of all of a, a Sh Shimka's other Vinoks, some of which we'll discuss next, the ribbons have all been cut to a uniform length. Those costumes are often worn by different dancers from year to year, do not have their lengths adjusted depending on the performer. We will now speak to some of Shumka's other Vinoks. Pictured here is a Vinok from Shumka's 50th anniversary costume. Designed and made in the Ukraine by Maria Levitska, these costumes have now become a staple in many of Shumka's performances of the last 10 years. Like the Poltava Vinoks, these ones are also adorned in cornflowers and poppies, but differ in their remaining decor. These are backed in grass and greenery, have ears of wheat reaching up high, and large sunflowers, which are the national flower of Ukraine. As an uh, anniversary costume, this Vinok certainly tells a unique story to the company. Unlike the Poltava costume, the 50th anniversary ensemble belongs to Shumka, and as such tells a community-based story celebrating half a century as the only professional Ukrainian dance company in Canada. This next image is of a Vinok from Mosquito's Wedding, a place, playful story about a mosquito marrying a fly. The, last, uh, the dance was inspired by a traditional Ukrainian folk song and a book written by Larissa Chaladin. The performance was paired with music by the Beatles and tells a story of diversity, acceptance, and love. The brightly colored costumes designed by Anna Ipetiva of Ukraine tell a fant fantastical story that upholds traditional styles from different regions of Western Ukraine while still nodding to the insects that each character is portraying. There are caterpillars, mosquitoes, flies, and all sorts of other bugs that look the part of insects in the fantasy world without ever losing their appearance as tra of traditional Ukrainian dance costumes. The Vinoks may be decorated with unconventional items like pom-poms and pussy willows, but they, are, they still emulate the main component of the Vinok with flowers and ribbons in a maiden's hair. These are only three examples of Shimka's Vinoks, and they are all examples of costumes still worn today. When I was a dancer with Shimka, costumes were less prescribed. We each had a Poltava, a Hutzel, and a peasant costume that we made ourselves. That belonged to us. I remember that my peasant Vinok was no more than a large poppy on a ribbon, but even in that simplest of forms, it was still recognized as a Vinok. But it's important to share that most, while well, most Shimka and Ukrainian dance costumes have Vinoks, not all do. Sometimes a dancer will wear only a small hair piece on a comb attached to, on top of her bun. And Shimka's Nutcracker, for example, has some numbers where the dancers only wear bows in their hair. While these costumes do break from tradition, they are all still, of course, Ukrainian dance costumes. While the Vinoks presented today have meaningful relationships to both the company and the performers, it is clear that the aesthetic of the Vinok is integral to Ukrainian dance costume as an art form. It is also important to remember that live performance exists through the interaction between audience and performer, and there is a distinct difference between the way both groups relate to the costume seen on stage. From an audience perspective, it may be invigorating to see the discussed Vinok swirling across the Jubilee Auditorium, but as a spectator's experience uh, cannot be the same as what a dancer in the same situation will be feeling. I cannot know what it must be like for a dancer to put on their Vinok for the first time, let alone for the hundredth time, nor could I understand the relationship forged with memories or ex and experiences unique to each artist and to their own relationship to Ukrainian culture or to their lifelong commitment to dance. There are likewise many layers to consider for an audience member taking in a Ukrainian dance performance. A Ukrainian Canadian who recognizes the music and dances will have a different experience than someone who did not growing, grow up experiencing or practicing those traditions. So might a dancer from a different genre or an artisan who makes clothes and costumes as I do. When I see a Shumka performance, I always notice the details in the costumes. Even if I do not relate to the history, tradition, and memory, I can engage with the beauty, construction, and movement of all of these pieces. These types of engagement may stimulate a desire to learn more about the cultural nuance of the art form, as I am currently doing through this project. As a Shumka mom, when I see a performance, I see the labors of my love unfolding on stage. As costume volunteers, we put our heart and souls into making the dancers look their best, so they can in turn share their own love of dance. As we wrap up this, our presentation and prepare to move into the next one, um, before the question and answer period opens, I would like to actually pose you, all of our audience members, a question. I would like to invite all of you, all of you listening in, not only to 
to ask us questions, but also to share stories of your own experiences, either as Ukrainian dancers or from watching a Ukrainian dance performance. Everyone's experience from the stage to the audience are unique, and we would love to hear some of those stories from you now. Thank you all for taking time out of your Saturday to come and tune in to this event and to the Ukrainian Resource and Development Center for organizing this symposium. Thank you, uh, Josie and Marianne. That was extremely interesting. I have um, learned so much. Um, I now want to go on uh, to Katya's presentation and then we will take questions. And uh, we all will have our thinking caps as to Josie's uh, question as well. So I would like to present, I would like to pass on, where's Katya? I don't see Katya, but I would like to have Katya come on screen. Oh, there we go. Right. Thank you so much, Slavka. And um, as Slavka mentioned, I'm Katja Chmiski, and I'm an MA student at the University of Alberta currently. And I'm going to be pre presenting on a chapter or a portion of a chapter of my upcoming thesis. And it's called Pandemic But Make It Fashion. As an integral part of Ukraine's national cultural history, embroidery retains a prolific heritage through its use in folklore, traditional costume, and various household and spiritual objects. The newest form of ephemera to be adorned with the traditional stitches is that of face masks worn during the COVID-19 crisis. Many scholars have historically outlined the cultural significance of traditional embroidery patterns, the act of embroidery, and the folklore surrounding it within the Ukrainian context. More recently, during the pandemic, the traditional art of Ukrainian embroidery has begun to appear on face masks and other forms of personal protective equipment or PPE recommended by public health officials to limit transmission of the virus. And while this, pre while this presentation and research does not explore the effectiveness of face masks in preventing the spread of COVID-19, and I won't be entertaining any questions regarding their effectiveness, it does examine how those masks are adorned in Ukrainian cultural, in Ukrainian culture transnationally. While these masks focus uh, function on a number of levels, I focus primarily on the traditional cultural beliefs surrounding embroidery patterns as protective symbols and the identity politics that inform open performative displays of culture. By addressing these phenomenon, I examine the function of embroidered masks as folkloric cultural ephemera within national Ukrainian and Canadian diasporic contexts. In order to do so, I draw on my ongoing ethnographic research and preliminary survey results from over 50 respondents regarding the use of traditional embroidery on COVID-19 face masks. I argue that cultural ephemera works to build community and preserve traditional forms of folk art within the COVID-19 pandemic, a trend that may be both revealing and valuable for the larger sphere of material culture studies and studies of traditional folk art adaptation and preservation. Embroidery as a cultural medium functions on two main levels, open performative and personal private. The open performative nature of embroidery functions on a similar level to performative culture. Maxim Krapovitz emphasizes that when we think of performance, we tend to focus on the theatrical elements of what it means to entertain, but the attention to a specific aesthetic and emotional interaction between the artist and the audience that is integral to all forms of performance is the same focus and interaction that informs displays of embroidery. In embroidery, however, the role of the artist is often removed with that connection being created between the wearer and their audience instead. The open performative nature of culture exists when the object in question displays a message to those who view it. Robert Klamash describes the public function of Ukrainian embroidery as a form of open display to underline a fidelity to ethnic loyalty and origin. With the familiarity of embroidered symbols and patterns within Ukrainian culture, displaying identity is at the forefront of mask wearing as cultural ephemera. The second function, which is personal private, focuses on the protective elements of masks and the beliefs, both sacred and secular, that accompany certain patterns. While these two functions can exist separately, they do not contradict or oppose one another and can often exist concurrently within folkloric material culture. Additionally, these functions act as motivators for those who choose to wear and create the masks. 
In order to fully understand the ways in which face masks and embroidered PPE impact the worlds around them and those who wear them, it is important to first consider these two separate functionalities and their roles within different aspects of life. Within Clamache's understanding of the performative nature of the traditional folk craft in modern material culture, he acknowledges the necessity of simplification and modernization of embroidery patterns and styles when they're included on cultural ephemera, and this trend is visible on many of the masks that have been created. However, Oresia Paschak Trach reminds researchers, embroiderers, and the general public that we must acknowledge the commercialization of the handicraft when presenting new styles and variants of the traditional patterns, rather than simply equating the patterns as one and the same. It is necessary to simplify a lot of these patterns, often for the sake of replicating on non-traditional mediums like face masks, or when using non-traditional methods, such as decalcomania or machine stitching. For example, the image displayed on the left is a generalized pattern of a larkspur. The species is unknown, and it's designed and presented on a COVID-19 face mask. On the right, there is a more traditional embroidery pattern of larkspur, and in the top right corner of the motif that is presented, you can see uh, the red circle on the screen to just highlight the portion that is uh, that flower. And in traditional Ukrainian embroidery, the larkspur is rarely found alone. Rather, it's often included in those larger floral designs, as you can see here. In order to make the pattern more suitable on a face mask, the single flower is simplified and created larger to best fill the space of one side of a mask, as opposed to the large motif that you see on the right, which runs the length of a woman's shirt sleeve on a traditional Vishavanka. And while pandemic wear is not a new phenomenon, with masks having been worn during the 1918 Spanish flu epidemic, the prominence of PPE as a fashion object is relatively recent. The availability of differently styled and patterned face masks has increased as global communities share designs and products on digital marketplaces. The unprecedented world of face masks has been difficult to navigate for many of us, with the information about the objects and their effectiveness changing frequently due to new research on the COVID-19 pandemic. And due to the novelty of face masks as a fashion accessory, there is little prior research available regarding their stylization or their cultural trends. Thus, we must turn to other relevant areas of research that can aid in our understanding of this new fashion, such as the function of embroidery as a talisman or amulet to explain the private personal elements. Ukrainian embroidery has been traditionally regarded with mystical awe and in many circumstances as a magical and protective talisman, with that embroidery possessing symbolic powers that could protect a wearer from evil and strife. And this is often associated with the different geometric, floral, and zoomorphic patterns of Ukrainian embroidery. And when they're found on face masks, it's presented with an especially interesting phenomenon to explore as it occupies a unique space within the areas of folklore studies and material culture studies. With floral patterns and plant life being some of the most prominent styles to decorate Ukrainian COVID-19 face masks, it is important to understand the meaning of these patterns in order to see their relevance for the portrayal of a macro-national identity uh, in the use of open performative embroidery. Mallow, which is often embroidered in bright colors such as blues, reds, and pinks, symbolizes love for native land, for nation, and the people that represent it. And it is frequently found in the Zhitomir region. The plant itself is used in folk medicine for sore throats and dry coughs. Although there is no scientific evidence to support the plant's efficacy. As for these symptoms, they're also commonly associated with COVID-19. So that makes this mask um, or this pattern particularly appropriate for a COVID-19 face mask. Uh, so the mask you see on the top is a three-layered cotton mask uh, with the top layer having been machine embroidered to feature that mallow pattern. Uh, while there are a number of different styles of mallow that are represented, I don't have any more information about um, kind of the, the species or the classification of the flower. It's just listed by the designer as Cervona Malva, uh, which translates to red mallow. 
Another noteworthy pattern that has been modernized and replicated on face masks is that of Kalina, or the Gelder Rose. Known as an ethnic symbol of Ukraine, Kalina is prevalent in both traditional and modern folk songs, such as Chervona Kalina and Odna Kalina, as well as in folk medicine, poetry, and many other facets of life. According to Aresia Paschak Trach, its beauty cannot be denied, its status in Ukrainian folk life is irreplaceable. The depiction of Kalina has become increasingly important within recent years as a national symbol expressive of Ukraine's yearning for freedom. It is through the depiction of national symbols such as the Kalina on masks that people are able, able to outwardly depict a macro culture used to distinguish themselves from other nations and traditions. And again, it is important to recognize the different shape and construction of masks in comparison to traditional Vishivanke and Urushnike. This construction influences where embroidery can be placed, what patterns are feasible to use, and which types of stitching are more appropriate for certain areas on a mask. For example, Marezhka embroidery, which is a type of cut and drawn openwork embroidery that creates negative space on the fabric, would be a very inappropriate style to use for PPE, as it would leave gaps in the fabric of masks, allowing the particles to enter and escape, completely defeating the purpose of covering your face. Masks have most commonly, commonly been displayed either with forms of cross stitch or lishtva, which is um, also known as a leaf stitch, even when they're not made with needle and thread embroidery. For example, masks that feature decalcomania or forms of patterns that are transferred and silk screened onto the mask, um, they still attempt to replicate the cross stitch style featuring patterns made up of little X's or squares that mimic the appearance of how an original cross stitch would appear. This type of representation of embroidery, while not truly embroidery, has been favored by many designers and healthcare professionals as it avoids poking tiny holes in the top layer or in any of the layers of the face mask. To fully explore the impact of Ukrainian embroidery um, on face masks within macro culture of Ukrainian society, I've conducted two brief surveys. The first is directed towards people who wear and purchase masks with embroidery and Ukrainian symbols, and the second was intended to be answered by artisans and designers who create and sell the masks. Both surveys were distributed to Ukrainian nationals and Ukrainian Canadians. Prior to receiving answers, I hypothesized that cultural pride would act as an influencing factor in the choice to purchase or create these masks, demonstrating the dominance of the open performative function of embroidery when applied to cultural ephemera. I believe that there are three primary motivations that will contribute to the overall pop popularity of culturally decorated PPE. The first is as a sign of patriotism and cultural recognition, as a fashion statement, and perhaps less importantly, as a talisman or symbol of protection within the private personal function of embroidery. Over the time period of the questionnaire, I have been able to better contact and interview more members of the general public regarding wearing face masks, as opposed to contacting artisans and designers. And so I've had 40 members of the general public in total respond to my survey, and they are primarily from Ukrainian Canadian backgrounds. Having shared the survey through various public forums online and through word of mouth, 19 of the respondents identified as being from a North American community and only six were residing in Ukraine at the time of their response. 15 respondents chose not to disclose their location. Additionally, eight of the artisans who responded were from Ukraine and only three were from North American communities. In order to fully contemplate the sociological implications of the use of traditional and modern representations of Ukrainian embroidery within the public performative function, I have analyzed the data collected from the surveys, highlighting specific areas of interest. One of the most effective ways to understand the data I've collected in the context of the overall thesis and theme of this presentation is through qualitative data analysis. As mentioned, the majority of respondents of the general consumer public survey identified their current res residency as within North America. However, the survey itself did fail to accommodate questions of ethnic identity using only geographical location at this time. In future research, it would be increasingly valuable to have respondents declare a nationality or their generational status within diaspora. 
in order to better analyze the connection between nationality, transnationality, and material folklore. One interesting trend that can be analyzed from the collected data was that based on the interviewees who participated, the majority of creators were from Ukraine and the majority of consumers were from Canada. And while it cannot be confirmed that the majority of consumers wearing masks with Ukrainian patterns are from diaspora, as fewer national Ukrainians were interviewed, it is valuable to recognize the export of masks from Ukraine to diaspora when considering the role of transnational Ukrainian material culture and folklore. When considering the consumer questionnaire, one motivation for purchasing or wearing masks, which I had not previously considered, was the philanthropic efforts to support community through the purchasing of the masks. For example, Jana Lalosh and an anonymous respondent purchased their masks from a fundraiser to support Ukrainian Orthodox camp for kids. And another motivation which I hadn't considered is that of masks as a family object, whether it is the pattern evoking memories of mothers teaching their children to embroider or wearing matching masks with family members as a way to bond and demonstrate common interest. The first and perhaps most prominent commonality among those who own embroidered masks was that, sorry, that was presented in the survey for the general consumer public was that every respondent who owned an embroidered mask except for one also owned other embroidered goods including clothing, household lin linens, and ceramic objects. This includes both Ukrainian and diaspora respondents demonstrating the role of embroidery within everyday lives of participants prior to COVID-19. With new forms of embroidery or Ukrainian styles becoming available on masks, for many of the participants it seemed like a quote no brainer to add them to their collection, end quote. Based off the most commonly used phrases and words from the consumer respondents, I've compiled this graph that you see now on the screen to represent different associations uh, that each participant had mentioned in their answers. So each bar will depict how many respondents mentioned the listed item as an association with Ukrainian embroidery, both on masks and in a general context. So the question that was asked to participants that this uh, depicts is what does Ukrainian embroidery, folk art and symbols mean to you? And this chart reflects the adjectives most frequently used by participants with some participants being counted multiple times to best reflect their answers. Each bar depicts how many respondents would have mentioned the listed item as an association with Ukrainian embroidery, both on masks and in general. And the chart you can see um, presents that the majority of consumer respondents associated culture and heritage with Ukrainian embroidery. Respondents also frequently commented on the artistry and craftsmanship that was required to create the masks. In consideration of the open performative nature of embroidery and face masks, the survey asks, how do you feel when you see someone wearing traditional embroidery or embroidery-like patterns in person or in the media? This specific question was answered by 30% of the respondents using variations of the word proud or pride. Associating cultural pride with the outward display of Ukrainian embroidery, participants noted that the display suggested a cultural connection and a sense of commonality between themselves and the other wearer. Those that assumed connections held between the witnesses uh, to embroidery, the open performative, function's role in promoting tradition through ephemera and asserting cultural importance is very evident. In contrast, only 8% of respondents had mentioned that they wore masks um, or associated them with spiritual protection, either secular or sacred, showing that fewer consumers recognized the tradition of personal private functions as motivators when they chose the masks. By comparing the answers from both designers and wearers, I have been able to conclude that the element of protection is pr primarily recognized by the former of those two groups. And I think if we look back kind of how embroidery used to be created, we can see why that association would be held. And so a late 19th century ethnographer who observed the creation of Rushnike during uh, a time of plague as a ritualistic form of protection noted that, quote, at the moment of passing under the sacred cloth, a community is protected from bone anew, disease is banished, demonstrating that those who have created the ritual objects and the patterns are then responsible for the protection of their village. 
The sentiment carries through to the mentality of artists today. When asked directly about the tra traditional talismanic properties of the embroidery on her face masks, designer Anna Marchuk responds that behind all of her embroidery, there is a meaning and that the masks she has made were only for the use of her employees as a form of spiritual and physical protection. Additionally, she mentions that she chose not to sell face masks during the pandemic, instead only creating them as gifts for her employees um, due to the tradition of giving a protection for the protection, according to Anna Marchuk, it must be gifted from the creator. As mentioned earlier, designers and art artisans were prominently um, residing out of Ukraine at the time of the interviews. And when asked about the meaning of folk art and embroidery, all of the participants had mentioned embroidery as a part of their own identity, whether it represented their ancestors, traditions, or heritage. Olena Rudchenko, the owner and designer of Begrumagi, creates both traditional and non-traditional patterns on her masks and believes that Ukrainian embroidery is, quote, the nation's genetic code, end quote. The owner of Fotinia Design echoes this idea by stating that embroidery is the history, the spirit, and the word of the people. For the designer of Fotinia, the inspiration behind creating the masks was love for your country and tradition and faith in your roots and tradition, as well as the act of creating a talisman. Additionally, the owner of Skrenya, a digital shop based in Ottawa, Ontario, notes that the shop began creating and selling the masks for three main reasons. To support Ukrainian producers and artists during the pandemic, to provide an in-demand object, and for personal interest. Prior to the pandemic, the shop sold both modern and traditional uh, examples of embroidery on clothing and accessories. However, the pandemic provided a new avenue for designers and artists to express themselves on a unique ephemeral medium. And after having seen others start creating these styles and uniquely decorated masks, Skrinya also began to follow this trend in order to make masks uh, more available in the Ukrainian Canadian diaspora. Similarly to the last graph, this chart depicts a qualitative analysis of the answers provided by designers regarding their motivations to create and sell masks featuring Ukrainian embroidery and or symbols. Using commonly mentioned words to analyze the responses, some are included in this figure more than once uh, to best reflect the answer of all the participants. With over 66% of respondents living in Ukraine at the time of the survey, there was a clear distinction between the answers based on the geographical location of the respondents. And again, because so few respondents from Canada were uh, interviewed at the time, I would be remiss if I didn't raise caution about creating any generalizations over uh, whether or not um, these are national sentiments. When asked about the motivation to create the masks, seven out of eight of the Ukrainian designers who participated in the survey mentioned protection or talismanic properties of embroidery as a motivation, but none of the participants living in North America had mentioned this traditional association with embroidery as a motivating factor for the creation of the masks. Instead, they more frequently mentioned that the masks were made for the sake of exhibiting Ukrainian national pride and to maintain an ancestral practice. The shift from the knowledge behind the patterns to the representation of ancestors and nationality when considering embroidery suggests that within the larger context of transnational folklore and embroidery, while the patterns may be the same, their contextual meaning is very important for those who create and wear them based on their location. More commonly, responses from both designers and wearers reflected on the visualization of national identity. For one respondent wearing the masks is a, quote, way to show off her heritage and pride for her Ukrainian cultural background. Seeing these masks and embroidery patterns on others also evoked a huge sense of pride for Gloria Heather and inspired Zachary Senek to wear the masks as well as to showcase his culture. Coming across uh, others who were wearing the masks in various forms of embroidery, whether modern or traditional, also evoked a sense of relatable re relatability for respondents, suggesting that they may share similar passions regarding culture, language, and history between strangers. So the prevalence of the creation of a macro identity through the revitalization and continuation of Ukrainian embroidery tends to 
um, sorry, trends have enabled mask wearers to embrace the open performative natures of displaying culture within everyday objects. Through the responses I have received to the survey to date, the consumers wearing the masks are more frequently to do so in order to support their community and recognize their cultural heritage. Most importantly, by asking respondents about their association with embroidery, it became evident that open performative functions of embroidery and the patterns of uh, these masks as a cultural identifier has entirely overshadowed the personal private function of embroidery as a talismanic or protective symbol. With the open performative function, these masks are being worn for the sake of sharing one's cultural identity as opposed to concealing it. And this is done with the manipulation of traditional patterns by designing new meaning to the performance or display of the item. While this research has provided a preliminary look at the performance, performative display of masks and the motivations to wear and create them, it does have the potential to expand significantly to look at where these trends and responses are most prevalent and examine trends among different diasporic communities, as well as different local regions within Ukraine. As many cultures share tradition of embroideries, this research could be further expanded to explore how different groups utilize traditional patterns of masks. Furthermore, the idea of understanding the beautification and politicization of personal protective equipment produces numerous questions when considering the approach taken to creating and wearing masks across a variety of cultures. I'd like to thank you for um, listening to my presentation today. And again, if you have any questions, uh, please use the chat bubble and Slavka will pass them on. Thank you so much for that presentation. Um, um, all I want to say is that give Ukrainians downtime during COVID, they will be creative. <laughs> That's for sure. Um, now we will be entertaining from both uh, presentations. Um, from And here is one from uh, Larissa Hajduk. She'd like to thank. Uh, Larissa Hajduk is our representative from the Grant McEwen. Um, she is also part of Threads That Connect. Thank you so much for a great presentation. The question is to Josie and Marianne. Have you considered a follow-up research on another piece of Shumka Ukrainian costume? Um, I think your work exemplifies a true university community collaboration benefiting all parties. It was a pleasure watching and listening to you doing it together. Uh, I'll go ahead and answer this one. And actually, Marianne is having troubles putting uh, her video and audio back on. So I'll step out of the room after I answer this. Um, so actually, I, I have to say that um, Larissa is uh, the person who first introduced me to Shunka and who ended up leading me into this presentation in the first place with Marianne, who thank you for getting your video on. Um, and it's been a fantastic year. And uh, the goal is actually to continue this research and to extend it beyond to material analysis um, of the, the Vinok itself and to um, potentially actually enter into interviews and to discover more about the, the relationship and the, the identity of the performer to the, the costume um, from their perspectives, because uh, so much of my work has been on archived performance costumes and working in museums, and I don't have the opportunity to speak to the artists who have actually worn these costumes. And so this is a wonderful opportunity that I'm really looking forward to continuing this study uh, and to further, further analyze specifically the Vinok, and then who knows how much further it's going to go. Um, but there is just, there's so much symbolism and um, tradition and culture that is embedded in every stitch that even just this Vinok is enough to keep me going for years, I'm sure. Um, and as Katya also made evident with her own presentation, specifically looking at a mask, which is an object that has only been around for the past year in North American culture, really, um, and, and how, how much work she's ended up getting out of that. That's one chapter of, I'm sure, at least five, if not more, in, in a thesis. So there's so much work. Thank you so, so much. Um, is there anyone else that would like to uh, ask a question? I personally want to um, say to the first presentation um, how much depth that you have shown us um, and, and, and uh, demonstrated with the Vinok. Um, I think most of us that are not involved in dance Mind you, I was a little bit way back in Winnipeg, but most of us think that that Vinok is just 
a part of a costume that is put on and taken off and that's it. Um, uh, today you've uh, shown us how much uh, actually that Vinok um, is part of that person's uh, journey through, through dance and through Shumka. So thank you very much. Katya, like I said, just give us some time and Ukrainians will be, will, will, will think of something. So um, uh, it is fascinating to see all those masks um, and, in, and in different types of um, embroidery. And I have seen them with people putting other filters underneath and from Ukraine, they're very um, uh, dynamic and it goes from being traditional all the way to just a little, Ukrainian flag on a black surface on, on the corner. So there's a lot, but uh, people like to feel, to identify uh, with their culture and that definitely was it. Um, is there anybody else that would like to comment? Joyce, did you wish to say anything today? I No, I really uh, enjoyed that presentation, Marianne and Jose, and uh, it was great working on all a lot of those head pieces that I saw in the pictures. <laughs> I, I was going to say, I'm sure that you probably recognized a few stitches there <laughs> with with those being being kid. And with that, um, thank you very much and um, have a good day, everyone. Goodbye.